So I think we have to have um, some sort of resolution of some of this, at least a, an initial pass on the things that are urgently pressing on your minds at this point. We have plenty of time tomorrow as well for a second session on this, but let's, let's at least get some of this resolved. So let's try some of the folks who haven't spoken yet. Nita, do you want to start? So thanks for an uh, incredibly interesting panel um, of discussions. I guess it wasn't a panel, but individuals. I, I wanted to start with a question for you, Sam, on, um, on your resolution that there are moral truths that we, uh, that we should be able to turn to. And um, specifically with some of the examples that you threw out, right? So one of the examples you used was does for forcing women to wear burqas um, have any increase in net happiness? And the second one was um, that cruelty is wrong and something that we can uh, all agree upon. And they're, they're quite different in their claims, right? One is a general claim and one is a quite specific claim. Um, and I would guess that you would have a hard time getting agreement on the first, which is a more specific claim, that there would be quite a diversity of opinion on that one. Um, and more likely to get uh, acceptance on the second one, that cruelty is uh, wrong and yet quite a diversity of opinion as to what cruelty would mean. Um, so I'm wondering how you could uh, resolve right, the, the tension between those. What, at what level of specificity do you mean that there are moral truths? Is it the more specific claim like uh, does forcing women to wear burqas increase net happiness? Do you mean it at the more general level like cruelty? And um, if you mean it one of, at one of those levels, how do we know and how do we, how, how do we find that moral truth? answer for you apart from saying that there is a right answer whether or not we're in a position to find it. I mean, it, if we could run this experiment, uh, all possible moral uh, communities exist and attempt to flourish by their own lights. There will be true statements whether or not we can verify them or not about one community being enjoying more well-being than another. And some of them are obvious and we can verify them and we can see the the economic and social and, um, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, moral deprivation of certain communities. Uh, and we can see some of the variables that conspire to make them that way. I mean, if you look, if you go into a failed state and you see a situation where there is virtually <coughs> no attachment uh, except for tribal attachment and no trust between strangers uh, and, you know, limbs are being piled up and machetes are being wielded, um, we can look at that and say, okay, there are many, very, many variables are in play, and we know something about how people get to that condition and people get to this, you know, the, the, the polite condition of a polite conversation, uh, you know, with, with openness to evidence and, and no appeals to force that we're enjoying now in, in our context. And so I think, um, uh, I think we'll know much more about the details uh, as we know more about the, the physical basis of, of human flourishing. And I think, that, again, I mean, the, once, once you agree that morality relates to the well-being of conscious creatures like ourselves, then all, all, the wor all the hard work is still ahead of you. I mean, that doesn't answer the question, what is eudaimonia ultimately? And if, if we can ma actually ma manipulate our own nervous system 100 years from now, if we can actually dial in different states of of the nervous system and even dial in different moral intuitions, then, then the, the question really opens up. I mean, what is actually optimal? What will flourishing <laughs> consist of if we ever arrive in such a place like that? But yeah. it's, um, I, th I, think we, I think the ground truth we have to get to is it is about consequences in conscious experience and it's not about uh, uh, superstition-based abstractions. Yeah. Could I come in on that? Could I add something? Um, Sam, I, I think that there, um, there are sort of uh, two different kinds of claims you're making. Um, the claim that there is a moral truth and eventually we could find it with science is one that I think many people would find uh, difficult to go along with. At the other extreme, your claim that sometimes we can say something, sometimes we can say that something is better or worse than something else, I think is absolutely right and I'm certainly with you on that. So when you point to a failed state where there is no trust, 
no government, no care for children, uh, where people are forced by others who have no concern for them to do things. Um, we can agree that is bad. Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely when you have the morality police in, uh, charged with uh, being able to do whatever they want to women with no supervision, that's bad. That's going to lead to terrible outcomes. So uh, if you think that me and Josh Green are relativists who believe that if three people think something is right, that makes it right, or at least that we can't criticize it, well, no. Very few people, uh, very few thinking people would ever endorse such a, such a statement. Um, but if you're going to be a moral monist and say there is a truth, and we can find it, and the way we find it is by counting up well-being, utility, mm. then I think you're in danger of hoisting yourself on that empirical petard because the happiest people in this country by far are evangelical Christians and Orthodox Jews, people who live in tight, um, according to Arthur Brooks, when he surveys, uh, when he looks at the, at the, uh, uh, the large-scale surveys, uh, basically the happiest person is a gun-owning Republican uh, Christian uh, right. living in a right. tight community. Yeah. Okay, there's, and the happy there's, there's a few caveats there. One is, how we find That's out, reports, Th right? this is why we don't have a neuroscience, I mean, we don't have a neuroscience of human flourishing, and because we don't, we have questionnaires where people report their level of happiness. You know the biases, I mean, you know, if you give a questionnaire to a fundamentalist question, Christian, are you hopeful about wait, the wait, future? Look, Sam, you know, what, you get Sam a, a but look what you're doing here. Bias. Look what you're doing here. We have empirical evidence. The empirical evidence is extremely consistent. Yeah. What do you do when faced with it? You go straight for, oh, but look, no, at, no, all no, no, look at all these problems. I, I will grant the you scientific so, spirit so, means you should at least look at the evidence, absolutely. take it at face value. I have and looked at it, and I believe it some be of right. it is probably true. In fact, if you put me in Afghanistan, uh, I would be guaranteed to be very unhappy. You know, the lone atheist Actually, who won't yeah. veil his daughter, right? That's a, that's a recipe for disaster. So, yes, if you put me in Afghanistan, I'm sure I'm going to become happier if my daughter wears a burqa and I c somehow conform to them. And, and, and so you're, you're talking about a study done in the United States based on uh, uh, conformity with a culture where 83 percent of people believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. If you go to Denmark, which by similar methodologies is rated the happiest country, the happiest society on the planet, they are essentially an atheistic society. Um, so it, you can, you can right. run it both so there, ways. Right. So there, there are multiple means. There are multiple ends. And I did, I liked that in your talk. You did say that there were like multiple maximum and minimum. I would agree with that. But you seem to have great faith in your ability to detect which ones are valid and which ones are not based on your own intuitions. I have, I have faith in the human ability unencumbered by dogmatism and political correctness to ultimately converge on these things, on principles like cruelty is wrong, on principle like, principles like free discussion and full transparency of information uh, is better than its antithesis. And I think we have that in hand to a gr degree in our liberally biased elitist culture in a way that uh, some of our conservative opponents in this culture don't, uh, and uh, certainly they don't ha have it well in hand in Afghanistan at the moment. And th this is a moral hierarchy that I think we just have to be honest about. And b yes, by your lights, when we find pathologies of liberalism, we have to be honest about that. And there are pathologies of liberalism. I mean, and you sent me a paper, a Pizarro paper, talking about how liberals were more inclined to be uh, uh, in certain moral dilemmas, li liberals are more inclined to, s to sacrifice a, a white person to save uh, many non-whites, but not a, a non-white to save many whites. Uh, and conservatives are more colorblind. And so this is a kind of a pathology of, of uh, fairness in, li in, in liberals. But yes, let's have all the facts on the table. But what I'm, what I'm objecting to in your work, and, and, and Joshua Green is certainly culpable here, and I've read his thesis on this, um, uh, there is a moral, there is a, there, there is, there are no facts of the matter about morals thesis. Uh, uh, and, and that's the punchline. We can't say that this is really, really wrong because the people who hate homosexuals are just as committed to their view. End of story. But that's not his reason for saying So, but, but can we just in, uh, bring Jonathan Glover sure. in as well? I, I, I think one of the, the points there that, that, that is uh, making, mentioning Pizarro's work is that a field starts. We, ha we now have a trolleyology field with people building labs and experiments and so on based on it. And here's, here's, some, here's some conflicting evidence. So it, it doesn't look as solid as it was. And it, one has to re rethink this stuff. But do you, do you have some comments on well, that? Could I make a slightly different point about something Sam said? Is that, is that right? Uh, I, I was 
sometimes when you were talking, I was feeling hugely in agreement, and sometimes I wasn't, because of an ambivalence I have about utilitarianism. Mm. And I think there's a kind of ambiguity in what you were putting forward, because you said what matters, you know, the, the thing that matters is human happiness or human well-being or human flourishing. Mm -hmm. Let's be a little blurred about right. which is the right term. Now, there are lots of things which people you and I might sympathize with in many areas, lots of things where people want to say utility isn't the only thing. There are all sorts of other things like distributive justice or liberty. It's worth sometimes having more liberty, even if it doesn't overall mm. bring a greater amount of happiness. Right. Now, I can never decide whether I'm a utilitarian or not for this reason, that it's always possible to respond to that kind of criticism by saying, yes, if that's what you value, that's part of your utility. Right, right. And as a result, everything gets, there's a kind of bear hug strategy that utilitarians do, right. so that everything can be incorporated within utilitarianism. But my worry is that if you do that, many of the most interesting debates in moral philosophy simply get somehow trivialized. And it seems to me that it makes for more clarity to be a pluralist and say, yes, I mean, for me, human well-being, as I understand it, maximum human well-being, right. is enormously important. I'm very close to you on this. But there are going to be cases where there are real dilemmas where it doesn't seem to be quite so, so it seems to me to be too brisk with the theory simply to say, well, all that matters is, is well-being. Right, right. Well, well briefly, I, I mean, no one who's read uh, Derek Parfit's book, Reasons and Persons, can uh, think that they're not real dilemmas with, with in thinking about utility and in, in, especially in aggregating utility. I mean, how we talk about the utility of millions. Are we talking about, are we worried about um, aggregate utility or the average level of, of well-being? I mean, both of these have paradoxes. If you're, if you're uh, you may know uh, Parfit's work, but he has this very famous argument called the repugnant conclusion. Uh, which su suggests that if you're if you're concerned only with total welfare in a population, then you should prefer a world where there's a hundred billion people who have lives only barely worth living, to a world of seven billion people living in perfect ecstasy, because there's more kind of positivity on the uh, in the aggregate. Uh, and if you think, oh no, that's not the way to think about it. We want average, the average level of well-being. Well, then you should prefer a world where there's just one happy person, to a world of seven billion people who are slightly less happy. Uh, and, you should, and you should want to go around killing all the unhappy people painlessly right now so that you know, to, lev to raise the level of average well-being. There are, there are paradoxes in population ethics. And if, if this seems just like uh, an academic exercise, there, it's not academic because when you think about the most important decisions we make as a civilization, these are decisions with reference to population ethics and aggregate well-being. How, what wars do you fight and at what possible consequence to non-combatants? How many refugees do you let across the border? What diseases do you cure first and et cetera? These are all population ethics concerns. But I do think, I mean, just to be glib and hand-waving, I do think the bear hug strategy ultimately works and it works with John Rawls and it works with, with um, it doesn't resolve all of the, uh, the population um, But Sam, the problem. response you've given me is all within utility theory. Uh, it's with it, It's all about uh, do we go for the maximum number happy or do we go for the greatest total happiness or do we go for average? And I absolutely agree with you, Derek Parfit and others have brought out you know, very powerful problems within no, that. But those are, those but, are weaknesses of utility. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm acknowledging weaknesses yeah, of utility. Yes, but, what, 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 but the kind of case I was talking about was where people might say certain other things are of value right. independent of their contribution to utility. For instance, some people say liberty matters, some people say equality matters, um, and you can either, there, are, there, there seem to be two dominant models. One is yeah. kind of our South Berlin model. Here are just lots and lots of different values, and we shouldn't be both harmonized. And the other is the bear hug strategy of saying, well, all these, if they're valued, count as part of utility. And I suppose what I'm kind of asking you is, isn't there a case for adopting openly the pluralistic model rather than saying it's all one unity, but actually there being all sorts of problems to unpack still within it. Well, I th not to steal too much time, but I think my notion of flourishing and utility is flexible enough. It, it, it is, a, in some sense, a, a, a promissory note that, has, that we will never cash 
in the same way we'll never cash the note of, you know, a complete understanding of the universe. It's, 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 it's the principle of open con conversation that's just going to lead us there. But I think it can embrace, you know, when John Rawls comes to us with the veil of ignorance and says we should be thinking of a society based on fairness, not on well-being, because if, if you're only focused on well-being, you have to take the well-being claims of the racist who gets a lot of pleasure victimizing minorities. Um, I think all of those moves are, are based on a, an, an unnaturally constrained notion of human flourishing. We don't have to, I mean, the racist who wants to victimize and the saint who gets pleasure in, in helping people, those, their utility claims are not on all fours, and we don't have to dignify the one equal to the other. Uh, but it's a, you know, it's a longer conversation. And and I think we need to get a few more of the audience. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Is short, short question to the entire panel. Good. Uh, I want to bring us back to the putative uh, neuroscience foundations well, that you mentioned. And this is a question, informative question. Are there evidences that uh, uh, if you have an activity, trigger activity of mirror neuron, it leads to some uh, elevated secretion of uh, oxytocin or vasopressin? That's one question. And then the entire, the different things about morality, you talk about and the mirror image and the attachment and empathy. We talked about people benefit or try to identify with the people that have happiness or uh, feel sore for people that have uh, some suffering. But if you look at the world, there are many people out there that actually their happiness has to do with suffering of other people. And I don't see, according to any, and this is a general question to the panel, how what one would explain or try to put in this uh, paradigm or theory that you called it, a mother that really feels joy when her son is, explodes itself, himself as a live bomb, or people that go to the streets and, or and celebrate when they see that there is some disaster happens in another country. Like in 9-11, there was a disaster in the United States, and people celebrated in some parts of the world, and they really felt joy. Mm. So I don't see how it fits to any of the things that we heard so far. Well, one of the things that, that you want, that I didn't really have time to talk about, but that I think did come up in a couple of the uh, uh, talks, at least very briefly, is that part of what happens with social attachment, or at least a, a very close attachment among members of the group, is that it looks like that that goes hand in glove with lethal intergroup competition. And then, so Sam Bowles' hypothesis is that part of uh, the um, evolution of altruism amongst humans depends on lethal intergroup competition. The idea being that the big strong guys go and beat up the neighbors, bring back the spoils, and then you have a roughly equal division of the spoils in order to ensure loyalty thereafter. And of course, because we know about that sort of in-group, out-group hostility in, in the history, I mean, which, which actually Jonathan Glover has talked about so much, uh, and because we know about it in tremendous detail with regard to the woodland champs, um, I think Sam Bowles' hypothesis has <coughs> quite a lot going for it. So it isn't really the case that we feel sympathy for all humans in distress or empathy for all humans in distress. By and large, we do for those that are within the group or those with whom we are familiar and are attached. And when bad things happen to other people, especially if they are people who dress very differently from us or look different or smell different or what have you, we often feel joy. And that just seems to be part of the biological inheritance. Now, that isn't to say that it can't be changed and there are ways of, as they say, incentivize, incentivizing decreases in hostility between groups. But it does look like both the close attachment we have to one another within the group and this very easy hostility that Zimbardo describes so well in these simple psychological experiments. That's part of the package. 
crappy as it is. And that, so that, we're not um, wonderful. I mean, we're yeah. this mixed thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, well, no. yeah, I mean, it's, <coughs> it's, the same, it's the same sort of thing. I mean, she feels a certain kind of joy because she, well, I mean, I'm sure Sam can speak to this better than I. Why does she feel joy, Sam? But I, I think we should acknowledge that there are, there are pathological, oh, okay. in, in a larger context, there are pathological forms of happiness. Happiness isn't the full story. I mean, I have no doubt that the suicide bomber, before he presses the button, is feeling some kind of religious ecstasy. He has worked himself up into a frenzy of belief. So ecstasy, you know, in that context can't be the, the, the answer at the back of the book of, you know, this is, you know, uh, you know this is what eudaimonia is. Uh, there's, there's a, we're, 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 the, ch the challenge is to build a global civil society where, the, where most of us can flourish most of the time. Uh, and clearly suicide bombing is not the greatest strategy for, for that. Yeah, the, the, there's also a literature on this if you want. I mean, you can talk to your artists, but there's a literature on some of this stuff. Tanya Singer some years ago did some work on what was essentially the neural correlates of schadenfreude, which is what you're talking about. And Naomi Eisenberger at UCLA did some work on essentially what is shunning, that when you, you, somebody's involved in a game, in a scanner, and they're left out of the, uh, left out of the action, you can, you can see pain, pain areas lighting up, being left out. Shun it, it's his first sort of neural correlates of shunning, in my view. I'd just like to add one, one point here, that if you think that morality is about harm and suffering, then you have all these puzzles and problems. How can people enjoy harm and suffering? Um, my view, and I think it probably would go along with, with uh, Peter's, um, is you should really first and foremost think of morality as a team sport. Morality is about binding teams together to compete with others. Uh, when Pat refers to the samples hypothesis, the basic idea is if there wasn't war, there probably would not have been religion or cooperation or society. So war, religion, cooperation, those all come together to help us compete and do terrible things to other groups. I don't think we particularly like it when bad things happen to people who are simply different. It's not just that they're different. It needs to be that they are our enemies. And the most savage kinds of violence, or certainly suicide bombing, seems to come about overwhelmingly, according to at least Robert Pape, uh, Pape's study of suicide bombers, comes about overwhelmingly when a, a culture that is different religiously has military force on the ground in your sacred homeland. It's like if a fist is punched into the beehive, yeah, some bees will go sting it. Not, I'm not defending that this is a good thing. I'm just saying this is part of the dynamics that led to the rise of civilization. You know, at, at some point, I actually plan to do, this, this is on, at some point I'd hope to do a program called This Is Your Brain on Comedy. Uh, w one of the reasons is that I re read an Umberto Echo es es essay some time ago, and he was trying to figure out what the, what the, the adaptive advantage was of, of, of not just humor, but of actually comedy. And um, reading around that area and thinking about it, I was looking at also The Art of the Novel by Milan Kundera, and he talks about the same sort of thing, that uh, he has a huge suspicion of cultures or people who are incapable of laughing at things. I'm thinking now about the cartoons. I'm thinking about people who, because a, a poor English teacher named a teddy bear Mohammed was about to be um, flayed or... Uh, it seems to me that if we could find some way of getting some more, slightly more humor into these things, that, that it might be just a little bit more interesting. But Although, ironically, exposure to comedy made subjects more likely to push the man in the trolley experiment. Yeah. It, so, so Bill Maher is in, is in deep trouble. Well, if you're in a good mood, you're willing to push the fat guy in front of the train. Uh, well, well, there we go. Uh, so I didn't say I had an answer. I said I was well, interested in exploring. <laughs> um, has anybody seen Religious? Was it good? Oh, okay. Oh, really? I can Review of one. Um, do, do we, 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 somebody else was down here? Was, uh, oh, Paul used to have it. Paul Zach. I did. Um, Hi, it's Paul Zach. I, I want to suggest some um, hybrid buddy. I want to suggest a, a way out of this corner of what is the right metric, and that is convergent evidence. So uh, we've looked at an uh, enormous number of societies and correlated trust levels with e basically everything we could think of, and you find the highest correlation of about 100 variables was self-reported rates of happiness. So high-trust countries are happy countries. Okay? That also goes strongly with low levels of inequality and low levels of infant mortality and religious tolerance and a freedom. These all run together. So I think we can, we can say, even in these societies, if there is the occasional riot or someone blows himself up, that's kind of an anomaly. That's pathological if the thrust is towards greater happiness, greater prosperity, greater freedom, 
uh, more free press, perhaps comedy. Uh, so I think you know, that's the way out of it. We don't need an absolute metric. I'm going to say, here's the one measure. So everything kind of runs together. So these are the countries like Denmark and Sweden and Norway. Um, everything seems to be kind of running in the right direction. And the second issue about, uh, I know uh, one of uh, Professor Churchland's uh, students is a colleague of mine, Bill Case Bear, and uh, many suicide bombers are, of course, drugged, and I, he told me that recently. So they really are fairly drugged out. So I'm not sure they're ecstatic when they put themselves out. No, I, I, well, I think that's, um, I would dispute that claim, but, um, uh, yeah, okay. I mean, there's, you know, a, a couple of anecdotes goes a long way to be, we are desperate to believe that this behavior is incompatible with psychological health and real religious commitment. And I just think it, all of the real study of this points to the fact that you can be very high functioning, not depressed. You can be the, you know, the quarterback of your high school team, essentially. You, you got all the girls, and you think the best thing to do is blow yourself up uh, on a, an airplane to get into paradise. Um, it really matters what people believe. And, and, there's a, and, and in the liberal community, especially, that we are desperate to think it's got to be an expression of some other kind of psychological but, or social but, pathology. But, Sam, with all due respect, Case Beer is head of NATO yeah, intelligence. I, I, I sure. yeah, yeah, okay, for Europe. I mean, Robert Europe Pape, and, I mean, I've read Pape. I haven't read Case Beer on this. Yeah, but I, and, and I think that, that you know, he, he's looking at the data very scientifically. So I don't think he's just relying on a couple of anecdotes, but whatever. It's the people, I mean, the Israeli psych psychiatrists who've studied failed suicide bombers and those who've succeeded, um, the people who studied the, the, you know, intimately looked at the background of the 19 hijackers, you're not finding depressed people with, with personal, especially personal histories of, of being uh, subjugated. You're not finding the, the, the poorest of the poor or the uneducated. I mean, if you look at the 19 guys who attacked us on September well, 11th, yeah. they were well-educated and high, very high-functioning and yeah. deeply religious. And they spent all their time at the mosque talking about the, 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 the pleasures that await martyrs. So, what was I think, that? I think they were um, probably soccer players. Where is Scott Atran when we need I mean, Scott Atran thinks the problem is soccer. So, you know, you can... I can guarantee Look at this soccer is not a problem. Erin right. <laughs> <laughs> um, O'Hara. Um, so I wanted to maybe offer a friendly amendment for um, Patricia for um, your claim of trust as a fundamental basis for morality. And the reason, the reason I offer it is because in the neuroeconomics games, they take a definition of trust that's kind of a standard willingness to make yourself vulnerable to another. And so... Um, from that perspective, trust is kind of an assessment of safety. It's not a moral value in itself. Um, you would, could think of trustworthiness as being a moral value, that is, knowing that another has made themselves vulnerable. Do you predate on that and behave selfishly, or do you not? Um, and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm glad you're here now. Um, I thought I understood his studies to show that there wasn't a relationship between trustworthiness and oxytocin levels, but rather the relationship was between trust and oxytocin levels. And if, if I'm right about that, then it may be that trust is influenced by the biological systems. It's not itself morality, but it's sort of clearing the way for moral possibilities. Yeah, that's sort of how I think about it. That is that the social attachment and the trust that goes along with social attachment really kind of sets the stage for the kind of problem solving that we do when we're trying to make a decision about what to do in this or that circumstance. And the fact that we are very attached to this person and want them to do well and, and feel bad if they feel bad and so forth is, is, is really the, the platform. And the trust I just think of as, as the kind of other side of the coin, if, if you like. But I, I, I take your point. I, I think this is a very productive point that, that Paul raised about trust. And I think we can actually bring together uh, some of the things that several of us have said as follows. Um, you know, bird got to fly, fish got to swim, human got to live in a, in a cooperative community saturated by trust. And I think this helps explain both why the Danes come out so well and why in this country the Orthodox Jews and Evangelicals come out so well because there are many different ways to create a community of very, very high trust. The Danes managed to do it with, you know, government level institutions that work well. In America, and it's, we're not very likely to get that anytime soon, so some communities have found other ways to do it without government. And so uh, a, a thought is uh, prompted by um, uh, Jonathan Haidt's um, 
quoting the, the golden rule, do unto others you haven't done unto you. Uh, that great philosopher, George Bernard Shaw, pointed out that it should be don't do unto others as you would have them do unto you because they may not like it. I mean, the implication being that, you know, <laughs> other people can be so different from you that you may not at all share their interests and desires and so on. <laughs> and, and, and what that leads to, the thought that leads to, is that our instinctual responses to others or the oxytocin-producing uh, experiences we have may sometimes require being overridden. In, in other words, that, that there's a, a place for socialization, education, reflection, and what have you, that actually runs counter to some of our instincts, especially when the instinct is to punch the other guy on the nose. Uh, so uh, that there has to be a, a more complex and indirect story about how our behavior, especially when it's conscious and deliberate behavior, uh, takes the form that it does which goes against the story that one might tell at the neurological level. Not, that's not to impute the, the fact that there, are, there is, obviously, there has to be this uh, neurological basis for it, but that there has to be also uh, uh, an added dimension. Maybe that's something that Pat well, could comment on. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think that's the part of the story that you invoke the reward system to describe. So, so it's learning as you grow up what kinds of things are disapproved of or approved of and what works and what you get punished for and so forth. That that's the, how the reward system is engaged. And so that when you're, you know, you finally reach the golden age of 15 or whatever it is, you have a pretty good idea of the kinds of things that are, are going to really be damaging to your reputation or that are going to, uh, things that, that, that you might, where you might get away with snubbing your nose at, uh, or thumbing your nose rather at authority and so forth. So I, that seems to me all part of where the reward system comes into the story. Now, I mean, I can say the reward system, but, but that's going to be a hugely complex story. But that's where, it's, that's where all of that is going to fit into the picture, I think. And, and, and you're, you're quoting Gary Marcus um, about genes providing a first draft. I, I, we can go into this at some other time at greater length, but even that sounds to me like too solid a product. Um, even a first draft has set a, set a lot of things in place. Um, uh, uh, with that? Yeah, yeah I, 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 think, I think there's more construction going on than, than, than a first draft, but we can talk about this some other time. Um, there's, there's actually one piece that, that I just want to put in here neurologically. George. That, 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 Sorry, go ahead. That, that links Pat's and, and Jonathan's presentations because it's not just about the reward system, because we have in the case of psychopaths essentially a, a perfect natural dissection of what we mean, what I mean by morality, you know, empathy and, and concerns about uh, harm and, and fairness. Um, and what, what we, the, the best theory of, of the, the neurobiology of psychopathy at this moment is that it, it involves the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, but it also in, it involves many other regions so that it's, it's, it's why an injury to the brain late in life doesn't mimic real psycho developmental psychopathy. There's some, that's something called acquired sociopathy where you have similar problems but not the full suite of, of problems of a psychopath, one of which is a, a, an, a predisposition to, to instrumental violence where your, your violence is not reactive, not driven by a, a rage you're flying into, but just a cold, calculated victimization of other, of other people to get what you want. And the, the theory that of, of how they uh, come to be this way is that there's amygdala dysfunction which, al which allows them not to recognize um, uh, a negative affect in other people, especially sadness and fear. And the theory is, is, that, is that we learn uh, to, we, our, our empathy gets tuned up by this punishment signal from others. Every time we transgress others in, in a morally relevant way such that we provoke sadness and fear in them, that is the, that is the unconditioned stimulus that we are sensitive to and, and it's, it, it modifies the conditioned stimulus of our, of our behavior. Um, psychopaths don't appear to have that and then they learn, they, they simply learn that it becomes useful to victimize people to get various aims. Yeah, that well, it's both reward and threatening. punishment. George Coop? Yeah, to that point, um, I, I was at Emory not too long ago and talking to Larry Young and this, there's a great deal of overlap between the reward system that attachment, um, the reward system that's the substrate for attachment and the reward system associated with addiction. 
but, but the converse is also true, which speaks to the last point, which is that, that um, those same systems that I talked about on the anti-reward system, the dark side of addiction, are engaged when you lose attachment. And so a loss of attachment, like the loss of a loved one or a loss of, 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 a, of a very dear friend, engages the same kind of um, opponent process that you see when you when you go into drug withdrawal, and and so your point that you just made, uh, Sam, is is valid there because it may be indeed that that a psychopath is that disconnect is occurring early on in life, and so it's not simply the loss of uh, it's not simply that their reward system didn't develop, but it may be the way their reward system reacts to. Uh, the loss, and, and they often suffer. I mean, we heard earlier that these individuals um, are abused, um, socially deprived, and all kinds of uh, trauma associated with early development. So it could be this kind of perturbation that sits in stage, what you call it instrumental, what I have mm -hmm. heard it called predatory uh, violence, where there is no affect associated with that is a that you know, every thing I've ever read about psychopathy suggests that the violence associated with psychopathy is indeed not effectively mediated. So the whole effective system is uh, implicated in in this. Mm. We're now um, only one hour over, um, which is some sort of minor miracle. But I, I think we ought to sort of draw to a close, and we can pick this up again tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you, the panel. Thank you.